holiday you season. Are you going anywhere? I'm not either. Nope. Uh, we will resume the hearing uh, and for I'd like to introduce our excellent panel of witnesses and I would for one of the introductions I would like to recognize the chairman of the committee Mr. Conyers. Thank you Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to introduce James Hoffa, uh, a Michigander. He, he joined the union when he was 18 years old. And uh, I, my father knew his father. Uh, my dad was a, an international representative for the United Automobile Workers. And of course, I knew James Hoffa's father as well. And so I'm very proud of him. He's, uh, he's more than just a powerful labor leader. His interest in human rights, civil rights, uh, and other issues makes him someone that I'm proud to say uh, comes from Detroit and we've had a good working relationship for a number of decades now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. Uh, the other, the, uh, going back to the other, other panelists, uh, uh, Seagal Mandelke has been Deputy Assistant Attorney, is that the way you do it? Mandel Kerr. Mandel Kerr. The vowel was yes. perfect, however. <laughs> it's the R was written like an E. Uh, she's Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice and has been since July of 2006. She supervises the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section, the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section, the Domestic Security Section, and the Office of Special Investigations. Prior to joining the Department of Justice, uh, Ms. Mandelker served as Counselor to the Secretary of Homeland Security, was an Assistant United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York, and clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas on the United States Supreme Court, and the Honorable Edith Jones on the United States Courts of Appeal, Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Ms. Mandelker received her bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan, her law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Chairman Conyers has introduced uh, 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 Mr. Hoffa, who we are very pleased to have as part of our panel. Uh, next to him is Gigi Sohn, who's president and co-founder of Public Knowledge, a nonprofit organization that addresses the public stake in the convergence of communications policy and intellectual property law. Mr. Sohn's comments, Ms. Sohn's comments and articles on intellectual property and telecommunication matters have appeared in a variety of publications, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. Ms. Sohn is a non-resident fellow at the University of Southern California Annenberg Center and a senior fellow at the University of Melbourne Faculty of Law in Melbourne, Australia. Ms. Sohn holds a BS in broadcasting and film from Boston University and a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. You could all get together. Um, Richard Rick Cotton is executive vice president and general counsel of NBC Universal. He supervises the NBC Universal Law Department, among other duties. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Cotton held other positions within NBC, including president of London-based CNBC Europe. Prior to his work for NBC, Mr. Cotton was in private practice, served as Deputy Executive Secretary of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and was law clerk to one of my favorite judges, Judge J. Skelly Wright of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and law clerk to one of my favorite judges, Justice William Brennan of the United States Supreme Court. Ms. Cotton holds a law degree from Yale Law School. None of that should be taken as any comment about either Edith Jones or Clarence Thomas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, without objection, uh, I authorize myself to declare a recess of the hearing at any point. And um, I would ask the witnesses now to let, to let you know that your prepared statements will all be made 
part of the record of in, in their entirety. And I'd ask you now, if you would, to summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help you stay within that time, there's a timing light at your table. When one minute remains, the light will switch from green to yellow, and then red when five minutes are up. We welcome all of you, and uh, Ms. Mandel Ms. Mandelker, why don't you start? Thank you, Chairman Berman, Chairman Conyers, Ranking Member Coble, and members of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the efforts of the Department of Justice to protect intellectual property rights through criminal enforcement. This committee has been an important partner in this effort, and I look forward to discussing ways in which we can further enhance our efforts to combat IP theft. The proliferation of harmful counterfeit products entering our marketplace, the emergence of organized criminal syndicates increasingly financed by IP theft, and the exponential growth of IP crime worldwide emphasize the importance of criminal enforcement to protecting IP rights. In addition to establishing the intellectual property task force within the department to focus greater attention to IP enforcement efforts, the department plays a key role in targeted and coordinated administration efforts. First, we are an integral part of President Bush's strategy targeting our organized piracy or STOP initiative. We work closely with our partners in other departments, local and national law enforcement, rights holders, and our international partners in a coordinated and aggressive strategy to fight global intellectual property crime. Second, we have significantly increased our domestic enforcement efforts. We now have over 230 computer hacking and intellectual property or CHIP prosecutors dedicated to these crimes and 25 specialized CHIP units spread across the country. In the criminal division where I work, we have 40 prosecutors in the computer crimes and intellectual property section, including 14 who are specifically dedicated to combating IP theft. These efforts are yielding results. In FY 2007, 287 defendants were sentenced on IP charges, representing a 35% increase over fiscal year 2006 and a 92% increase over fiscal year 2005. Third, with the advent of the internet and the steady increase in counterfeit products smuggled across our borders, we are placing great emphasis on our international efforts. We now have two intellectual property law enforcement coordinators stationed overseas, one in Bangkok and one in Sofia, Bulgaria. And indeed, I just got back from Bangkok where we launched a new intellectual property crimes enforcement network in Southeast Asia with high-level law enforcement and customs officials from 13 countries. Of course, IP theft in the People's Republic of China remains a key concern to the department and the administration. And so we have enhanced our law enforcement relationships with China's Ministry of Public Security. This past summer, these efforts resulted in the largest ever joint FBI-MPS international piracy operation, resulting in the seizure of over $500 million worth of counterfeit software and the dismantlement of what is believed to be one of the largest piracy syndicates in the world. Fourth, we are working closely with, closely with victim rights holders, both by putting on joint training conferences and most impor importantly, through our ag aggressive enforcement actions. We are also working, of course, with this committee and Congress on new policy initiatives and legislative tools to improve our enforcement efforts. And while we are still in the process of reviewing the Pro-IP Act introduced last week and hope to be able to provide more comprehensive comments at a later time, I wanted to share the administration's preliminary views towards this legislation. First, we greatly appreciate the Pro-IP Act uh, and it, its incorporation of a large number of legislative recommendations contained in the administration's Intellectual Property Protection Act of 2007. These include provisions to increase penalties, harmonize and strengthen forfeiture and restitution provisions, and ensure that exportation and transshipment of pirated goods through the U.S. 
are subject to criminal penalties. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Ver Berman and Chairman Conyers on your remarks regarding working with the administration on other key provisions in this bill. As my written testimony reflects, we do have significant concerns with Title V of the Act, which would have a, we believe would ha could have a detrimental effect on how the department conducts intellectual property enforcement. <coughs> I see that my time has expired, and so in conclusion, I would like to thank you and other members of the committee for your leadership on protecting IP rights. We look forward to continuing to work with this committee on the Pro-IP Act and to identifying ways in which to advance our common goal of providing owners of intellectual property with the robust legal protections that they deserve. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mandelker. Uh, Mr. Hoffa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Berman, uh, Ranking Member Coble, and members of the subcommittee. It's a great honor to be here today. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify about this very important bill, uh, 4279. Uh, it uh, is very important because it protects intellectual property rights and raises the fines uh, for stealing copyrights. I'm here on behalf of the Teamsters Union, our 1.4 million members. Uh, I'm also speaking for all workers who are lucky enough to belong to a union and those who belong to a guild or an association. And I'm also speaking for those that are not as lucky to belong to a union, but we're here to protect them too. Intellectual property theft is a terrible problem uh, for American workers. Uh, as Chairman Conyers said, over 750,000 jobs have been lost. And by the way, we'll say hello to my great friend, our great congressman from Michigan, John Conyers, and we go back many, many years. You know, we're talking about how, where do we go from here? How do we protect these jobs uh, at a time that we see America losing jobs, we see trade deficits out of, uh, out of control? Uh, where do we start? And one of the ways to stop is to stop the counterfeiting uh, and stop the invasion of uh, these properties and uh, all the different things we see coming into our markets. Um, I also appreciate the fact that there's been tremendous work done by the Coalition Against Counterfeiting and Piracy. The job they've done in documenting uh, many of the things that we're talking about here today is very important. Uh, they've spoken out about these crimes that hurt corporate profits and tape, take American jobs. Some people might think that it's no big deal to buy a knockoff handbag or a fake DVD, but it is. These crimes kill jobs. They take good jobs and it's in the hundreds of thousands. As part of our fight for good jobs, my union and many other unions have battled against uh, so-called free trade agreements that opened the door for piracy. We fought NAFTA and we fought PNTR. Uh, we've said all along that they kill American jobs and hurt the American economy, but even in my wildest dreams that I ever think the damage would be as severe as it is, or that counterfeiting would be as widespread as it is today. China is now the biggest source of knockoff products and pirated goods in the country, in the world. Uh, there are 88 different companies in China that make knockoff Yamaha motorcycles. Can you imagine that? Almost all the personal computers in China use pirated operating systems. When the Chinese government tried to crack down on counterfeiting last year, they confiscated 85 billion or million books, movies, and computer disks. In the United States, uh, if we hadn't agreed to PNTR with China, we might not now be dealing with tainted food, exploding cell phone batteries, toxic toothpaste, and defective tires. Today, China's aggressive export agenda is more than our country can handle. The part of, of the bill that creates new intellectual property enforcement positions within the executive branch will do much to control and address the problems we're talking about. Changes in civil and criminal law to keep pace with new technologies is also important. This bill is particularly relevant to my union. We represent workers in many industries that are hurt by counterfeiting and piracy. Uh, Teamsters uh, work very hard to keep good paying jobs in this country. We're very active in the motion picture industry. We also have many members that are animal handlers, uh, location managers, uh, drivers who uh, transport actors around the sets. We're very active in that industry, and we've seen layoffs because of counterfeiting and knockoffs. People who steal movies may think that they're not hurting anyone, but they are. 
They're stealing 140,000 jobs a year. They're also stealing millions of dollars from pension and health and welfare funds that have revenues that are linked to the sales of DVDs. The recording industry has been hit even harder than the motion picture industry. In the past few years, EMI Group, Warner Music, Sony Music, Universal Music Group have laid off thousands of American workers because of theft and counterfeiting. All told, the American entertainment industry loses 370,000 jobs to pirates and counterfeiters every year. Some people think that they have a right for inf to information uh, on the DVDs and CDs, stuff they can take right off their computer. They don't think that they're hurting anybody, but in the end, they really are. I think that's wrong. People have a right to earn money from the intellectual property that they create. By the way, the Teamsters Union supports our brothers who are very active in the strike with the Writers Guild. The television and motion picture industry wouldn't exist without the content that these proud union members provide. The Teamsters represent several hundred thousand truck drivers. According to the Consumer Report, there is a growing problem with counterfeiting of brake pads. Uh, there are brake pads that are even made with kitty litter. And we find out that many, many people have had this problem and uh, we see that there are problems there. I see that my time has run out. Let me summarize by saying this is a continuing problem and what we have to do is to have strong legislation to address it. But we have to do more than that. We have to do something with trade. We have to inspect what comes into this country, whether it comes across the border uh, from Mexico or whether it comes in from the Far East. It's a global problem that all of us can address, and I think that this bill is a very important beginning to enforcement and to stop counterfeiting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Hoffa. It's, uh, it is great to have your support. Uh, and speaking of support, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I recognize uh, Gigi Sung. Chairman Berman, Chairman Conyers, Ranking Member Coble, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to speak today on H.R. 4279. I want to thank you first for keeping the uh, process of looking at this bill open and inclusive. And I do want to praise you, both chairmen, uh, for your and your staff's work in deleting some of the most onerous provisions, as you mentioned before, Mr. Berman. Thanks are definitely due to both of you. Well, I agree that enforcing IP laws is essential to encouraging creativity and promoting economic growth, certain parts of the bill could undermine these goals by threatening ordinary consumers and legitimate innovators with broad and inappropriate penalties. I'd like to focus specifically on three provisions. First, Section 104 of the bill would disaggregate the parts of a compilation or derivative work for the purposes of calculating damages, multiplying the already massive statutory damages associated with copyright infringement. Increasing damages this way will have a severe chilling effect on legitimate uses of copyrighted works and on innovation. This stands in stark contrast not only to the legislative history of the 1976 Copyright Act, but also to the goals of the Patent Reform Act of 2007. The apportionment of damages in that bill recognizes the harm to innovators inherent in disproportionate damages awards. Second, Section 202 significantly expands the forfeiture provisions attached to four different times of IP violations applying the exact same standards to each. This expansion risks even further upending rational copyright remedies and ignores the significant differences between copyright, trademark, and anti-bootlegging laws. Section 202 allows forfeiture of materials only remotely connected to an infringement, including materials and devices merely intended to be used in infringement. It also creates a new civil forfeiture remedy with a far lower burden of proof. Third, Section 102 eliminates the requirement that copyrights be registered before criminal enforcement proceeds. Copyright registration is critical to informing the public of a work's copyright status and its proper owner. Without a vibrant copyright registry, users of a work are often unable to find the copyright owner and obtain permission to use that work. This leads to orphan works that can no longer be exhibited, reproduced, or seen. Reducing the incentives for creators and authors to register their works can only worsen this problem. These three provisions represent a step away from a rational, realistic copyright regime, one that can allow a copyright law enacted before the invention of the VCR to adapt to a post-YouTube world. Numerous problems con confront current copyright law, but increased enforcement is not a cure-all. When the mere act of forwarding your email or posting pictures on your blog can infringe copyright, it makes more sense to have the law comport with reality before increasing the sanctions for infringement. 
While a complete review and overhaul of copyright law might be an ideal, I have proposed a set of six more modest reforms for the immediate future. They include one, reforming fair use. With the introduction of new technologies, courts have recognized newer forms of fair use, like time shifting and other personal, transformative, and incidental uses of copyrighted works. Yet these uses continue to be challenged by litigious plaintiffs. These fair uses should be expressly added to Section 107. Fair use should also be restored to Section 1201 of the DMCA, and passing H.R. 1201 would be a good place to start. And I was pleased that that's something you might consider, Mr. Chairman. Two, placing reasonable limits on <coughs> secondary liability. Innovators should not be afraid to innovate. Congress should codify the standards set out in Sony that technologies with substantial non-infringing uses are not liable for infringement committed by others. Three, preventing copyright abuse. Copyright owners should be discouraged from filing spurious DMCA takedown notices or from threatening copyright lawsuits in order to suppress speech. Four, providing for fair and accessible licensing. Licensing provisions need to be clear, simple, and rational for creators and users. The fee that webcasters pay to composers and performers should be reduced to a reasonable level. And performing artists should be compensated for public performances of their works, regardless of the medium on which they are played. Five, addressing the problem of orphan works, I discussed that already. Six, informing consumers of digital restrictions on their media. Consumers should know before they buy digital media whether it is restricted by DRM, and they should know the legal penalties for removing it. Each of these proposals directly addresses a situation where a consumer or innovator <coughs> might face the already draconian sanctions of copyright law. If the disconnect between the law and the reality of copyright isn't <coughs> tackled first, increasing the severity of those sanctions further does very little good. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Cotton. Uh, Chairman Berman, Ranking Member Coble, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I thank you for inviting me here today to testify on H.R. 4279. My day job is Executive Vice President and General Counsel of NBC Universal. But I appear here today in my role as the Chair of the Coalition Against Counterfeiting and Piracy, or CACP. The CACP is a broad, cross-sector business coalition led by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers. The CACP now numbers more than 500 companies and associations from two dozen different sectors across the economy who have come together to fight the vital economic battle against counterfeiting and piracy. And I might note that our coalition includes technology companies, both software and hardware, all of whom have IP that deserve and need protection. At the outset, let me quickly emphasize four points uh, many of which were addressed by committee members in their opening statements. First, the economic future of the U.S. rests on our technological invention, our creativity, and our innovation. Counterfeiting and piracy corrosively and perniciously undermine that future. IP theft is a jobs issue, and that is what brings the business community and the labor community before you today united in support of stronger IP enforcement. IP-dependent sectors drive 40 percent of the growth of the U.S. economy and 60 percent of the growth of our exportable goods and services. Second, counterfeiting and piracy constitute a health and safety issue that presents a clear and increasing danger to the public, from counterfeit toothpaste laced with antifreeze to exploding batteries. Third, counterfeiting and piracy is the new face of organized crime. Organized crime goes where the money is, and today that means piracy and counterfeiting. And fourth, and this I submit should drive a lot of the attention of the committee, counterfeiting and piracy today simply represent a global pandemic that is getting worse, not better, in every sector which it afflicts. Over the past 20 years, advances in technology, manufacturing capabilities, and transportation have allowed organized criminal gangs, counterfeiters, and pirates to escalate the scale and the scope of their operations to tidal wave proportions. It is not a criticism to say that our current enforcement is not stemming the tide. Our efforts to counter this pandemic have simply not kept pace. Despite the daunting scope of the challenge, there is hope and a clear path forward. If we are to turn the tide in this country, we must radically escalate our efforts on many fronts to protect the economic fruits of our innovation and our creativity. 
efforts in the private sector, in developing technology, and at the forefront of our discussion today, government action. The Pro-IP Act is a needed declaration of war, escalating the priority of this vital public policy and deploying dedicated enforcement resources to the battle. We commend the committee leadership and their staff who have worked so hard to pull this important and comprehensive bill together. While the Act does not contain everything the CACP had proposed, it does recognize three fundamental steps that our government must undertake in order to make a difference. Number one, excuse me, the Act creates key leadership positions to address the challenge of counterfeiting and piracy at the White House level and within the Department of Justice. Number two, it mandates a dramatic reorientation of government strategy to focus on dedicated, specialized resources, including FBI agents and federal prosecutors dedicated to IP investigations. Money for state and city IP enforcement programs and international specialists based in U.S. embassies in key countries around the world. Number three, it updates several laws that have failed to keep pace with the burgeoning threat of counterfeiting and piracy. In conclusion, two final points. First, these steps are strongly supported by a powerful new study released today by Dr. Laura Tyson, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. That study concludes that for every dollar invested in IP enforcement, federal tax revenues would increase by four to five dollars. U.S. economic output would increase anywhere from $40 to more than $120 for every dollar invested, and state and local revenues would increase by nearly $1.5 billion. In conclusion, a plea to the subcommittee. Every generation faces new threats and is judged by how quickly it recognizes and responds to them. Make no mistake about it. The U.S. business community and the U.S. labor movement have come here today with a single and simple message. Global counterfeiting and piracy have reached epidemic proportions and will choke off future economic growth and future job growth if current trends continue. It is not too strong to say that the unprecedented and explosive scale of counterfeiting and piracy represent a dagger aimed at the heart of America's future economic security and the health and safety of our people. My plea to the subcommittee is to confront this threat and to take strong, swift action to enact the Pro-IP Act in this Congress. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, in your comments about the, the, the revenue impacts of dollars spent on enforcement, I'm wondering if we couldn't calculate the benefits of this bill in dealing with our appropriations process in these last days. Uh, you know, creative scoring that um, frequently has been. Well, we would ask that uh, Dr. Tyson's uh, study be included in the record, and it might great, help yeah. in that respect, Mr. Chairman. Good. We'll do that. Um, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, you, you made a number of interesting suggestions and, and, and helped set the framework for some of the discussions. I want to focus on the registration issue first. Uh, I agree we have to turn to Orphan Works, and this committee plans to do this early next year. Uh, but I'm curious about two aspects of your testimony uh, dealing with your opposition to the position, the provision in this bill on registration. You talk about orphan works, the orphan works problem, and that it is crucial to require registration before criminal enforcement because you can minimize the orphan works problem that way. If that's the case, and, uh, and I see your point, would, a, would you support a carve out for registered works from being considered orphaned? Would I consider it a carve out for registered works? In other words, the one of the, you're concerned about the, us removing the registration requirement in a, right. to allow enforcement uh, put, put, creates a potential for many more orphan works. And so uh, then I say, is the flip side true? Once it's registered, then it really is an orphan. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, but here's the problem. And as you well know, photographers, who I know have spoken to you and who have the most objection to orphan works, fixing the orphan works problem, it's because the Copyright Office only has a text-based registry, it's almost impossible, even if you do a good faith search, to find 
that work. So if I'm a photographer and I've got a picture of the Statue of Liberty, the way I register it is a picture of the Statue of Liberty in text. So part of the problem is, is the, the current copyright registry doesn't make it easy to find certain works that are already registered. So in my mind, it would be unfair to punish somebody who wanted to use, let's say, for a history book, a picture of the Statue of Liberty, did a good faith search, but could not find the owner because the description, there's no way to actually right now find a picture. I think there's technology that will allow you to actually scan that picture, but we well, don't have what that if, right what if What if you narrowed the carve out? Well, I'd have to I, 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 take your, I take your point. I, I think there, but there are a lot of works that the act of registration means you know where the owner is, and as and you don't have the problem that you've just raised in those areas. And I'm that, that's correct. And at that point, a reasonable search, you know, under the the last bill we had on orphan works, so I'm, I'm using the language from that. A reasonable search would come up with that. That shouldn't be a problem. The problem is that there are certain instances, particularly visual arts, as you well know, where it's not that easy to find it on the copyright registry. One more, one more issue on registration. Uh, you talk about the disincentive to register because of the ability to proceed in criminal enforcement case without a registration. Yet on statutory damages, where a registration is required in order to receive statutory damages or attorney's fees, you talk of the possibility of damages being so draconian that it forces excessive damages or settlement and is enough to stifle innovation. Wouldn't the possibility of statutory damages and attorney fees be motivation enough for a copyright owner to register their work? Isn't the ability to get those statutory damages and attorney's fees far going to exceed the incentive to not register, uh, and uh, and wouldn't this wouldn't this change about the requirement of registration to bring a criminal case not have the repercussions? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm wondering, are, are, given the balance I mean, of incentives, I agree with you. I mean, I don't, and that's why I don't understand why this provision is in this bill. No, but, it, but, but I guess my point: I, there are hmm. there are some good reasons, and I'm going to let. Uh, I, I think rather than go to my next question, I'll let uh, Mr. Cotton. Exp develop the reason. It's a narrow but very important situation why the provisions in the bill. My only point was I don't, I, I just, I, I can't buy the notion that it is such a huge disincentive for people who would otherwise register their works not to register them given that they lose the chance for statutory damages and attorney's fees if a registered work is infringed and they don't have that opportunity if it's not registered. But Mr. Cotton, why don't you just you I just, well, you know, you can, as you know, you can always register after infringement happens, okay? This eliminates the need to, to um, right? So if, you, if you're not registered and somebody infringes on your work, you have time to basically fix that and then register. I think if the infringement, I'm not sure I, I, I know what you think I know because I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> that if the infringement comes before the registration, I'm not sure for that infringement you can collect yes. attorney's fees and statutory damages. But we'll find that out. Mr. Cotton, and then. Well, m Mr. Chairman, what I, I'd make two, two uh, points. There, there are, as from a public policy point of view, there is simply no reason to tie the hands of a prosecutor from uh, taking action when there has been a clear action of copyright infringement uh, simply because whether or not there has been a registration. The question is whether there has been an infringement. And in many cases, certainly in the industry that I come from, where there can be a pre-release theft of a very valuable piece of work when in fact the registration cannot have uh, taken place and there may be very urgent need for the prosecutor and investigators to move quickly, uh, there, is, uh, there is no reason to tie their hands. And secondly, from the point of view of incentive, I would just have to say that I can't conceive that anyone would, uh, who was in, 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 interested in preserving and protecting their IP which would, uh, and which would allow them access to statutory damages would d make the decision not to register based on the highly uncertain question as to whether a prosecutor might or might not take up a criminal case to protect their particular work. So that I would say, A, from a public policy point of view, there's no reason 
uh, not to allow prosecution in serious cases, and secondly, the notion that, an, that there is an incentive which would cause a copyright owner not to register uh, because they would be relying on the highly unpredictable notion of whether or not there would be a criminal prosecution is not just not in the real world. Uh, my time has more than expired. Mr. Coble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for appearing this morning. Ms. Mundell Kay, it is my belief that IP-related criminal offenses traditionally have not enjoyed a high prosecutorial priority. I do believe, however, that has improved in recent times. With that in mind, what percentage of the department's resources are dedicated exclusively to the investigation and prosecution of IP-related criminal offenses? Uh, Mr. Coble, I, I can't give you a specific percentage, but what I can tell you is what resources we do have dedicated to this important problem. Um, we have 230 computer hacking and intellectual property prosecutors um, spread throughout the country in the various U.S. Attorney's offices. Each U.S. Attorney's office has at least one prosecutor who is specially trained uh, to work on these types of cases. In addition, within the U.S. Attorney's offices, we have 25 units um, of chip units, so of prosecutors of two or more who are, again, specially focused on IP theft. And within the criminal division where I work, we have 40 prosecutors in the computer crimes and in intellectual property section, uh, 14 of which are exclusively dedicated to IP theft. Of course, um, this is an issue that is a priority within the department, uh, and so we have a task force of individuals across the department who are focused on this pro problem, including myself, uh, including um, uh, somebody in the Attorney General's office and also in the Deputy Attorney General's office. I got you. Thank you. Ms. Stone, let me get your opinion. Do you know whether a website may be considered to be a compilation under the Copyright Act A? And if so, do you know whether website owners actually register their sites with the Copyright Office and whether they would be conceivably, in, would they conceivably be entitled to statutory damages in, in the event of infringement? Certainly, I, I don't see why a website couldn't be considered a compilation. Uh, and I, I don't really know if website owners, I assume some website owners would register their websites with the Copyright Office, sure. Well, as some, some critics of, of Section 104 have alleged that it might have the, the effect of intervening in ongoing copyright litigation. What do you say to that? Could you repeat the question? I'm not quite sure. I, I say some critics of Section 104 have alleged that it, it, that this section, if enacted, might have the effect of intervening in ongoing copyright litigation that has been initiated. What is your response to that? Oh, that's entirely possible. I mean, uh, it depends on whether you want to make it retroactive or not. Obviously. Uh, Google is being sued in the Google book search case. Uh, they're being sued, uh, their subsidiary of Vi Vi um, YouTube is being sued by Viacom. So it's possible it might have an effect. Well, I was going to ask Mr. Cotton a question. I'm having a senior moment. I was going to ask you a question, Mr. Cotton, that I cannot grasp it for the moment. So with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back before the red light appears. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Coble. Thank you, sir. You were chairman promotion. for a long time. <laughs> the great days when you were chairman. Of this Thank you, sir. I remember them well. Uh, Mr. Watt, the gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I find myself in much the same position with respect to this bill as I did at the outset of our discussion about the patent reform bill. Um, my sense is that there is a substantial amount of um, need to reform and do something to address the, the problems that exist, uh, yet the technicalities of what need to be done, um, uh, there is substantial disagreement about um, 
And um, uh, so I'm here really to try to learn more about what those technicalities should be, what the concerns are, and um, try to assess, try to get enough basic knowledge before I really start uh, going through the details of the bill uh, to try to figure out where um, some of those inquiries and concerns might uh, be addressed. Um, so uh, with that, I think I will yield my time to the chair who can ask some of those uh, technical questions. He had a long list. I, I, I knew he had a long list and needed more time to explore it. Uh, so uh, I think I'll um, yield him the balance of my time and I'll sit and listen like I intended to when I came in. Well, that's very nice of you uh, and I accept. Uh, but, and, uh, but I would say the one difference between this and the patent bill is that here I would say 90% of the bill is not particularly controversial, and and uh, I wish I could have said that about the patent <laughs> bill. <laughs> well, that's what you told me at the outset of the patent bill. Uh, but, uh, it's my line before you, the, this one isn't as controversial. <laughs> the, <laughs> the more I looked at it and the more I talked to people, um, uh, the less I believed you. <laughs> and the less I believed myself. <laughs> um, I want to take a little time here on 504. You were, you were kind enough, not in your public testimony, uh, to argue that which you argued in your written testimony, that my approach on damages and copyright is somehow inconsistent with my approach to damages in the patent bill. Um, uh, other than the hobgoblin argument, uh, I actually don't think they're uh, uh, that inconsistent. It seems to me Section 504 now, for the, with that phrase, for the purposes of this subsection, all parts of a compilation or derivative work constitute one work that it has a bot. I think that one that language has a bias uh, in favor of the infringer rather than the owner. Um, I understand at a very different time with technology was very different why it was done. Uh, you didn't want somebody, uh, somebody was infringing the sixth edition of a book, you didn't want to give them six because there were five other editions earlier in circulation, you shouldn't be charged with infringing all six versions of the book. Uh, but what, what is the policy reason to distinguish between infringer A who takes 20 photos from one site and infringer B who takes 20 photos, one each from 20 websites? where under current law, infringer A would be liable for a single statutory damage award as determined by the court, not mandated by this bill, and infringer B would subject to 20 separate statutory damage awards determined by the court. Uh, there, there may be objections to the overall level of statutory damages, but accepting for the moment that we're going to have some statutory damages, how does that disparity, how is that disparity justified? Well, I, I, I think the disparity comes from, you know, what kind of threats one copyright holder can make to, you know, to a legitimate user or, or somebody at least who thought they were being, using copyright work legitimate, legitimately, or an innovator. I mean, y you talk a lot about the judicial discretion, but the fact of the matter is, is that most of these cases don't ever go to court. Okay, the threat is hold over, held over the innovator's head or the user's head and it never goes anywhere. There's a settlement, uh, the person no longer uses the copyrighted work. So to me, the judicial discretion doesn't really solve the problem, and it is the same problem in the patent context, is that, is that the threat is enough to stop people from innovating, and the threat is enough to get people to settle, even though they might have a ca good case in court. They won't well, test the bounds of the law. All right, well, we'll, we'll continue this discussion, but in the patent, 
you never argued, and you were a great supporter of that legislation. And I continue to be. Yeah. You, you never argued that we should, on a product that, that a, a counterfeit product that infringed on 50 different patents because it was all in one product, it should be considered as one patent violation. Uh, and our goal in the patent bill was simply to give the court the discretion that the courts here have to decide on how to calculate the damages. But uh, I think I've used Mr. Watt's time. Uh, and, and now, Mr. Goodlatte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if uh, uh, Ms. Mandelker, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Uh, would you explain in some more detail some of the concerns you have about the provisions in the bill that require reorganization within several federal agencies? What are your specific concerns? Yes, uh, uh, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, in, in particular, I would note that we have a current structure of coordination within the administration that works quite effectively. Um, as it currently stands, we have an IP law IP coordinator who sits in the Department of Commerce um, and who regularly ensures that we as an administration convene and coordinate as appropriate. So for example, uh, we meet month, I meet personally monthly with my colleagues in the other departments. Um, we coordinate regularly on international programs. We work very closely, for example, with the State Department um, in the deployment of our intellectual property law enforcement coordinators. We recently put on a conference both with the Patent and Trade Office uh, and the State Department uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, in which we launched a new regional network. That type of coordination um, is very important and it is happening at very high levels within the administration. Our concern uh, with putting um, a, an office within um, the executive office of the president uh, is uh, in particular for the Department of Justice, we are always gonna be concerned when you have somebody um, uh, at the White House who may be in a position of directing our enforcement priorities or um, directing what cases um, we should do and what cases we shouldn't do. Um, that, that would be contrary to the longstanding tradition of the department uh, making independent decisions when it comes to uh, law enforcement decisions. Uh, in, in addition, as I noted, what we have right now is actually quite effective. Um, while we don't um, coordinate with the UST TR, for example, on, on all matters, we do um, contribute to the Section 301 um, process. Um, we do provide them guidance as necessary when it comes to um, uh, criminal enforcement policy um, that, they, that they seek to push overseas, uh, likewise with the, with the State Department. Um, but we, what we have really right now is a flexible coordination process that can adjust um, to the changing needs of the different departments, um, and it doesn't um, impose uh, unnecessary bureaucratic reporting structures. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cotton, uh, we've been talking about the uh, compilations, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain uh, the rationale for allowing damages for each individual piece of those compilations. I wonder if you might ex explain the nature of what compilations are and, and well, the rationale. Uh, uh, let me just speak uh, uh, carefully here, Mr. Goodlatte. The, um, uh, s the uh, change in the, in the law was not part of the original CACP uh, proposals, um, which uh, is the organization I'm representing today. We have strongly endorsed the, sub the uh, committee leadership's bill, including 104, and in doing so, uh, we really are focused not necessarily on the specific uh, specifics of that uh, of that provision, but on the anomaly uh, really that the chairman reflected, which is that it does seem a problem to us in terms of the fact that the current penalties for uh, a compilation which may include 12 or 16 or many multiples of that uh, in terms of individual works remains the sa is the same penalty as for the infringement of a single work. And those works in a compilation may have different owners and, uh, and different creators. And so the, uh, in terms of resolving that anomaly, we do think it is worth uh, the uh, effort 
to try to find a resolution which does recognize the fact that it is, in many circumstances, a more extensive uh, violation of, of copyright in the, in the context of a compilation than in the, in the infringement of an individual work. Ms. So? Yeah, I think I finally have the answer to Mr. Berman's question, um, and it'll, I think it'll also answer yours. What we, the reason that a compilation is looked at as one work is because you're looking and, and differentiating that from, from you know, uh, engaging in 20 different or 10 different acts of infringement is that you look at the act, right? You don't want to, you don't want to punish somebody 10 times for one act of infringement. So if I'm infringing on 20 separate photographs, I've engaged in 20 different acts of infringement. If I've infringed on one album, I've engaged in only one act of infringement. And it seems to me to be a pretty dangerous tool, again, getting back to the answer that I originally gave you, uh, to a copyright holder to all of a sudden turn one act of infringement into 10 or 20, or you know, depending on how big a compilation is, even more. You want to respond to that, Ms. Cotton? Y yes, I would say, I mean, I think the law's tradition has, has been precisely to make those kinds of, uh, of tradition. Uh, petty larceny is not viewed the same as grand larceny. So the precise question that gets addressed in, in a criminal assessment is exactly the extent of the damage and the extent uh, of, the criminal, of the criminal act. And certainly one uh, likely, I would say, uh, grounds on which to make that assessment is the number of, uh, of infringements involved and therefore the extent of the damage to what, as I say, may be multiple different owners and creators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. And uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I was detained in another meeting, but uh, in reviewing briefly your statements, I appreciate very much your presence here today. Mr. Hoffa, you've had a long history of speaking what we call truth to power. Uh, and as I reviewed your statement, it was provocative because I began my remarks about the uh, devastating impact that piracy and trademark violation has had in the American economy. I think the mood is very sour in the United States right now in terms of uh, our economy and generating jobs. And I, I would just like you to pointedly repeat again or, or to, to focus on uh, how you think uh, this legislation uh, will be a, can be a viable component in saving jobs, in producing jobs, uh, and the impact that you've seen uh, in, for example, um, certainly uh, we know that uh, your home, Michigan, or your, your beginnings um, was at the top of the heap as many of us grew up. Uh, we'll never forget that first shiny car uh, coming uh, from, uh, obviously from Detroit, but whatever showroom it was, maybe some of us got a shiny used car, but how proud we were uh, of that vehicle and where are we now as it relates to uh, that whole effort, even though we might not attribute that to trademark violation, but what kind of piercing impact uh, has a trademark and piracy, trademark violation piracy done in your perspective, from your perspective? Well, thank you, Congresswoman. I, just got to I think it's all tied together. The idea of unfair trade and the fact that we do not build in uh, strong enough protections in our trade bills are all related. And that's why we have fought a number of the trade bills that are before Congress, uh, whether it goes from NAFTA to PNTR to the recent uh, Peru agreement. And we've talked about the fact that we must have uh, ways to, number one, protect our economy. And when we talk about that, we're talking about copyrights, we're talking about counterfeiting, uh, and we're also talking about the idea that we, the trade should be to open up markets that we make agreements with. And too many of our agreements are one-sided. They basically open up our economy uh, to a flood of goods from all over the world. And we see with China and Mexico uh, and uh, especially India. And so many of that, so much of that material is counterfeit. Uh, we all know that we can go on the streets of New York and Manhattan, we can go over here to Georgetown, and we see whole stalls of counterfeit material. Uh, that looks like something that has been made by a major manufacturer? Uh, and the answer is we're not policing and protecting ourselves. Trade has a, been a major issue 
uh, of labor talking about how do we protect American jobs. And we have seen a hemorrhaging of millions of jobs, you know, going to cheaper economies, going to Mexico, going to India. Uh, that's part and parcel of the same problem of copyrights um, and counterfeiting. Uh, and that counterfeiting and what we're talking about today is part of the same problem. Because when you open these economies, whether they come in legally or illegally, they're coming in and just flooding into this economy. Uh, I have testified before Congress about how we don't police what comes into this country. Uh, the container, uh, you know, 90 percent of what comes in comes in containers. And if you've been to the ports of Port Elizabeth and New Jersey or you've been to Long Beach, Long Island, you see all these containers coming in. Yes. Uh, much of this stuff is in that stuff, and they're only pr protecting and inspecting 1 percent. And if we had better inspection, then we could find out where these counter goods are and confiscate them at the border. And the answer is we're not doing that. And that's why there's such a flood of counterfeit goods. This in legislation place. moves us in that direction. That's right. Thank you. Let me quickly ask questions of the final three witnesses. I want Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Hassan to give us the most troubling feature in this legislation from your perspective. Uh, Ms. Uh, Maldecker, if you would, I mentioned earlier the incident with the Colgate Palmol of the toothpaste uh, and the uh, impact uh, as it relates to the consumer. Uh, someone uh, injury, we don't know if there was any loss of life, any long-term damage. And uh, my uh, thought was, uh, not from the tort perspective or liability perspective that the injured party may have, but that there be enhanced penalties if, for example, it does result uh, in uh, the injury and or death of an ultimate consumer of that uh, pirated product or that trademark violation product. Why don't you comment on that? And Ms. Son, if you could. N n let me go to Ms. Baldecker first, please. I, we agree with you, um, mm -hmm. Congresswoman, and in fact, that's why we were so pleased to see um, enhanced penalties in this bill for um, instances where um, there's a knowing or, or reckless um, injury to a serious bodily injury. So we think it is quite appropriate to have enhanced penalties um, when our citizens are being harmed um, by, these, by these products. And it separates it from a tort action. It triggers under the actual trademark violation, which I think is very important. Ms. Son, you, what is it? Clearly, Section 104 is the most troubling. Uh, I, I would note that uh, the other supporters of this bill actually haven't mentioned it in their written testimony. is something that's really important to them. And I'm also pleased uh, to hear Mr. Coble talk uh, about well, it. Why don't you just go ahead and say 104, and then uh, how would you fix it, or what, what is your issue with it? I think it needs to be deleted from the bill. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, right now, I mean, hopefully we'll have this roundtable. I'm not sure how you fix it, because it's so core it's so opposite to, you know, to what the Copyright Act has been about. And you feel that it does what? When I say does what, what it does, does, it does what negatively? It increases the statutory damages for copyright infringement so much as to place very bad limits, chill innovation and chill legitimate speech. So you're thinking that people will be fearful uh, because uh, they might step on someone's toes uh, and therefore deny their own creativity because the penalties are so high. They already are fearful, but this would make it far worse. Well, don't you think the counter impact is that then we would have at least a sanctity around this whole concept of copyright, patent, and the lack of trademark infringement? Well, I think we already do. I don't think anybody is arguing that statutory damage these, these days are inadequate. You may have heard about the woman in Minnesota uh, who was just fined $222,000 uh, for 24 songs she had on a peer-to-peer -peer network. That was $9,250 a song. I don't think anybody's arguing, it, arguing that that's inadequate, and that's the law today. So I'm not sure that increasing penalties tenfold or twentyfold does anything other than stop legitimate innovators and legitimate speakers or users of copyrighted works, legitimate creators from creating. I thank the gentleman. I, I just um, would say, Ms. Song, I, I think it's worthy of consideration of uh, the provision that you have highlighted. Uh, I think what we have seen in some of the egregiousness of trademark infringement has moved this Congress to believe that there are larger bodies other than the uh, unfortunate woman in Minnesota, maybe others, that we have to make a very strong statement. Uh, and I know Mr. Cotton was shaking his head, and I'd ask the Chairman, to yield him just a second to comment. 
uh, because I know he's a poster child yeah. uh, in terms of this uh, issue. If, if the chairman yes, yields him Mr. Cotton for a quick uh, response. And I thank the chairman for his uh, indulgence. Well, I, I, I would just say that I think the emphasis that the Congresswoman placed is the fundamental thrust of what the big picture of what this bill is all about, which is that what we know right now is that our enforcement regime, both in terms of penalties and in terms of enforcement resources, is not stemming the tide that we face collectively. And that what is, what is critical is that we step up, we make the penalties that we create not just a cost of doing business for the counterfeiters and the and the uh, organized criminal uh, conspiracies that are behind uh, the flood that we face, but that we actually make it a serious deterrent. We apply enforcement across the, uh, across the board. That is the big picture. The gentleman from Thank Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, uh, yes, just, just some thoughts. Um, and certainly I appreciate the efforts of, uh, of the Chairman, uh, who has um, introduced this legislation uh, to help uh, mitigate some of the loss that, uh, that Americans are um, uh, undergoing as a result of uh, copyright and trademark infringement. And I'm, I'm fully supportive of efforts to cut that so that American businesses can prosper. I am concerned about the fact that uh, the enforcement provisions of this law, of this proposal, both civil and criminally, uh, would uh, go more towards uh, Americans as opposed to uh, those in other countries who are responsible for the tsunami, if you will, of uh, counterfeit counterfeit uh, uh, products entering this country and circulating around the world. And, um, and so I, that brings me to my issue uh, of uh, free trade, if you will, and the agreements that this country uh, uh, signs with other countries. And there seems to be a uh, lack of uh, strong protections in these trade agreements uh, that would uh, be helpful in stemming the tide of uh, these counterfeit goods uh, coming here and circulating around the world. Uh, would you comment on that, uh, Mr. Uh, Cotton? Uh, I, I would make uh, three very quick points in response. Uh, first, I think the issue that, that you raise is critically important, but what I would say to you is that in arguing the case internationally for stronger IP protection action by countries internationally, they look to the example of the United States in terms of what they should do and how they respond. Even the Chinese? Well, the, uh, I would say, to, uh, ultimately I would say to you, yes. That is to the extent that uh, the to the extent that we wind up with counterfeit goods on our streets and to the extent that we ask countries every place from China to many other countries uh, in the world to devote and to, uh, to devote very significant resources to enforcement and to escalate the message. For example, in Well, how do, how do we do that in our free trade agreements? How do you well, counter I, the notion that our free trade agreements don't go far enough with respect to strong um, uh, protections for well, I, um, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I would agree with you that it would be desirable to use every lever that we have available to us. And I okay. guess my only point I was making was that I, I would agree with you that it would be desirable to have our free trade agreements. I'd, it is desirable, which... It, it seems that those are, those are the best route to be able to stem the tsunami of uh, counterfeit goods coming over here and circulating uh, around the world, even though I appreciate the stronger enforcement mechanisms that uh, are a part of this legislation and the aspirational uh, aspects of this insofar as uh, international enforcement coordination that is called for under this bill. But let me, let me shift now to this issue of, um, of the registration of uh, copyrights as a prerequisite to criminal prosecution and then 
this legislation would remove uh, the registration requirement. I would ask uh, Ms. Mandekler, normally in a criminal case you have uh, a need to prove intent and is there such a need in, uh, in uh, I would assume that that need to prove intent is a part of uh, the, uh, the criminal uh, laws insofar as copyright infringement that exists now. Would that uh, change under this new legislation? And if it does not change, how could you prove intent uh, in a situation where uh, you could not find uh, where, uh, 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 say, a photograph is, copy is, is, uh, is copywritten, it has copyright protection, but you can't find it due to the technological, technological limitations of, of, uh, uh, of the uh, copyright department today. How could you prove intent? Well, let, let me just say at the outset that we actually see this um, provision as a clarification of existing law. We think it's important to make it clear in existing law that proof of registration is not a requirement when we bring our criminal cases, um, but we don't think this is actually something new. It's just, again, a, a clarification. Certainly, we need to improve uh, prove intent, uh, willful in, intent. Um, and I, I would How can you do that without uh, registration? without a registration requirement? Well, I, I might um, turn to the, um, if, if you have an individual, for example, who clearly um, tried or made a good faith effort um, to find out whether or not a particular work was registered, um, who, who um, sought um, intent or uh, they would have wanted a to seek They That's would have exactly a defense, right. but it's, it would not protect them from being prosecuted being hauled off to the jail, fingerprinted, have to make bond, hire an attorney, and then present your defense at some point later. Well, let me just say that we, at the department, we're really interested in going after willful infringers. Well, so how we're, can you prove willfulness without, without a prerequisite of, uh, of uh, registration? How, how, how could a prosecutor make that assessment without uh, a uh, requirement that the work be registered. Well, again, I, I would I would note that we don't think that 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 it's currently a requirement for prosecutors. Well, it uh, should be. It, it would seem to me it, would, it should be. I, I would also note that in many of our cases, we're dealing with um, not just one uh, good, but many counterfeited goods. Um, and as was noted earlier, it would really slow down the criminal prosecution process to force our prosecutors to go um, make that d determination. Uh, again, at the department, we're focused. We're going to be focused on. We're not going to be focused on the example that Ms. Um, Ms. San noted of an individual who uh, took a photograph. We're going to be focused on those large-scale infringers. Yeah. Well, if the state of the law allows you to go against that small photographer, sometimes it will happen. A uh, renegade prosecutor, if you will. So I'm I'm concerned about the. Uh, doing away with the uh, registration requirement. I'm concerned about that. The, the, uh, the time of the gentleman has expired. We'll be having a vote uh, soon. Uh, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm one person in this room who supports Section uh, 104, and I think we uh, ought to try to emerge with uh, as strong a bill as possible. But I'm going to focus my uh, attention on Title IV which deals with the international provisions. And uh, Mr. Hoff, um, we have kind of a, a procedure here under our wonderful free trade agreements. Uh, and under this bill, we're going to have 10 new intellectual property attaches for the whole world. And it'll go something like this. One of these attaches will go talk to the Chinese and yell and beg and uh, point to them where it's their legal obligation, because we, we're good lawyers and we believe that paper matters, and point to them how they're supposed to enforce uh, intellectual property. Then he or she will leave the room. Uh, the Chinese will explode into uh, laughter, uh, because they're good enough diplomats to be able to suppress that laughter while we're actually in the room. 
then uh, they'll put back on their earnest faces. They'll have a press conference. They'll announce that we're going, they're going to do something. They may actually go out and grab a few counterfeit products, uh, put them in a warehouse until they resell them later, and then we repeat the whole process at the beginning of the next year. And I wonder whether you think that we need to instead uh, think of some things that go beyond the text of these free trade agreements and actually, uh, for example, uh, take a, a boatload or two of goods coming in from China and uh, turn them around in order to uh, demonstrate uh, our uh, concern on this issue. Well, I think the problem is that, you know, in, in this country, if you find a clear copyright and you, mm. you buy the, 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 the counterfeit goods, you can sue. And there's a legal system here mm. where you can enforce rights. That isn't really true in China. You're up subject to a completely different system. Uh, and if you do find, uh, you know, uh, a copyright infringement in China, you really are in, a, in a tough shape. And our agreements have not done anything to give you any type of rights uh, to enforce your rights over there. You might go to the communist government and they might say, okay, we found a, a thousand DVDs and then they'll run a steamroller over them, um, you know, for the TV cameras. Mm -hmm. Or they'll set some uh, DVDs on fire when, when in the, with the video cameras. And that is nothing to do with enforcement. Uh, there isn't really a way to bring lawsuits over there uh, that can be effectively to stop this. And when there are violations found in China, it isn't the Chinese government that finds them. It is, and I don't, I don't want to single out the Chinese, but it's true in India, it's true in Mexico. It, the problem is, it's the industry that finds them. You know, every uh, major uh, manufacturer has a part of their company that is devoted to find mm. knockoffs or copyrights. So they go and find these and they show, you know, the Chinese or the Indians, look what you're doing. Mm. What are you going to do about that? Uh, and then you can bring a lawsuit, and then there will be some kind of, they'll shut down two or three factories. But the two or three they shut down, there's ten more. So somehow we've got to have, in our trade agreement, some way um, either to re reciprocate or, or some type of way to protect uh, our, our products from being copied. And of course, the best example is the dog food example, where we had that this summer, where we went through, the dog food came in, and the dogs were dying because it, you know, it had uh, different products in it. And then we had the, the issue about the Colgate, copyright uh, Colgate with the antifreeze in it. And these were dreadful examples of what can happen because there isn't anybody um, in these countries looking for these violations. Anything goes in these new economies. Unfortunately, they're really at their early economies. Anything to make money goes. Uh, over here, we don't have that problem. We have consumer safety, we have the Justice Department, we have a lot of enforcement, we have individual lawsuits, and we have damages. You know, if some, somebody does do this and we identify them, they can be sued for millions of dollars. You really can't do that in China and you can't do that in India. So the problem is, how do we put that into a, into, into a trade agreement? And I think until we figure that out, we ought to stop doing trade agreements for a while and realize the problems uh, that we're losing jobs. Should we be... And we ought to figure it out forcing a renegotiation of the trade agreements we have now or just leave those on the books the way they are? I, I think that all of them should be, you know, we, we've talked about uh, you know, renegotiating NAFTA or terminating it and starting over right. again. Um, people cringe at that. You know, think about it. All the trade agreements that we've done, have you ever known one that's ever expired or that we've, we've, we've stopped? I mean, once they're on the books, they're like, no one can ever stop them. You, know, you talk about, well, why don't we just void that agreement? And every one of these agreements has a provision that end that agreement. You know, it's a 60-day note. I, I would also point out we that every that. single one of them has increased our trade deficit with the country uh, involved. We've talked a little bit about the need to inspect these containers. Uh, should the cost of inspecting these containers fall upon all taxpayers, even the businesses that are in competition with imports? Or should we uh, have at least the fair cost of uh, uh, examining the containers fall upon uh, those who are bringing the containers into the country? Well, there are billions of dollars in profits being made by these large shipping companies. I don't think it would be wrong that they pay part of this cost. They're the ones that are bringing in uh, these shiploads of goods in these containers that are coming from the Far East and all over the, the world. Uh, and if you've been to the ports that most of them have, you see how they're piled so high. And, and it, the odd thing is, there are shiploads of containers coming in, but when they go out, they go out empty. 
And that is really a, a, a story about what's wrong with our trade agreements. It's a one-way deal. They're not buying our products, but we are bringing their products in. So we have talked about the fact that large shippers should pay a small portion or at least you know, a per container cost of inspection rather than have it put on the American taxpayer. The time of the gentleman has Thank expired. You. Uh, I have an idea. We've been doing it with terrorism laws, nonproliferation laws. You and I have been doing it with laws dealing with Iran. We have extraterritorial application of our copyright and trademark laws. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, yeah. that's a, for, for, you surprised me. You're going one step beyond what I thought was already a um, pretty extreme position. I'm gonna, I, the gentleman from North Carolina gave up part of his time. Uh, earlier, we've had a string of Democrats, so I'm not going to recognize him because he did have a question he wanted to ask to Mr. Cotton. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for my ineptness. I misfiled my question. I just wanted to hear from Mr. Cotton. I don't think it's been addressed. Mr. Codd, the decision to require dedicated resources at DOJ, the White House, and elsewhere is somewhat unusual, and some in the executive branch, I think, would argue wrong-headed. They imply that it will create an inflexible and, and meddlesome bureaucracy, and I'm not convinced that that would be the case. What do you say in response to that? Well, I, I think our experience teaches uh, one lesson very clearly, and it is one that has been reported to me from every sector of the coalition uh, that I'm involved with, which is that, uh, is that officials that have a general jurisdiction responsibility wind up having other pressures on them to the extent that IP enforcement tends to fall down the, the to-do list, and that until there are, are both senior policy uh, executives and until there are significant dedicated specialized IP enforcement resources we will not make progress in addressing the issues that are that are on the table I thank you so that's what I wanted to get in mr. chairman I thank you for recognizing me appreciate it the gentleman yields back and I recognize the gentleman the other uh, another gentleman from California mr. Schiff <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I join my colleagues in strongly supporting the legislation, and I, I congratulate the Chairman on all his superb work. I appreciate, uh, in particular, also inclusions of Sections 511 and 512 um, that we have proposed uh, parts of uh, to create the state and local law enforcement grants, as well as uh, um, strengthen the CHIP units. I had a, a couple questions, some ideas that we have been kicking around. Um, actually gets to, uh, goes a little shy of what Mr. Sherman and Mr. Berman were just proposing on the international front. I was kidding around. I, I know you were. Uh, I have a, a more modest uh, idea I'd like to run by the committee. And before I do, I just want to make a comment on Section 104, which has some, some um, surface appeal to me, but I'm still wrestling with. Uh, when I think about the analogy, um, Mr. Cotton, that you mentioned of uh, prosecutors or judges separating out petty larceny, larceny from grand larceny, I also think about the fact, though, that we don't, uh, when we charge someone for theft of an automobile, charge them for theft of the automobile, theft of the radio in the automobile, theft of the seats in the automobile, um, even though those might, uh, or a theft of a briefcase in the automobile, even though the briefcase might belong to someone different than the automobile belonged to, um, it would be theft of an automobile. Um, and just looking at, at the discretion we've given to the judge to determine whether the distinct works have independent economic value, you could say that also about objects in a car. Um, so I, I, I think we need to think about it a little more. I, I haven't reached a conclusion on it. I can see certainly the value uh, to be added by it. Um, but I want to run some other uh, thoughts by you on the international front, for example. One of the thoughts that we were kicking around was the idea of tasking uh, the Commerce Department with uh, posting a list of um, websites that clearly infringe. Uh, we, we know many of the most well-known. Uh, a lot of them use uh, major credit cards, take major credit cards. A lot of them have advertisements from major companies. Uh, presumably some of those companies, or credit card agencies, aren't aware that these are, you know, uh, websites that are dealing in hundreds of thousands of pirated works every day. Um, do you have any feedback on whether you think that kind of idea, wh whether it be housed in commerce or the copyright office or somewhere else, might uh, have some uh, value to it? 
Um, and then a second thing I'd like to throw out there, which is, I guess, more incendiary. Um, we do a favor for the, uh, some of our institutions of higher learning, which are also often very problematic from an IP point of view, by giving them uh, a broad safe harbor uh, should we require the use of uh, filtering devices if we're going to allow that safe harbor. Uh, so if I could throw those two ideas out there and get your feedback. Uh, well, I'm uh, delighted to make a comment because uh, this entire area is really a, the second focal point in addition to governmental action of the uh, coalition against counterfeiting and piracy. It is a recognition that there are sectors of the economy uh, that are intermediaries. Frequently, they're actually business partners of many of the brand owners in the sense of, uh, of working with us. But the question that you pose is whether perfectly legitimate businesses, but who by virtue of their infrastructure become the means by which counterfeit and pirated goods get into the stream of commerce, have some responsibility to address that issue and to take action to reduce the degree to which their infrastructure is used. Uh, my uh, primary example of this would be the collective judgment that uh, uh, we as a society came to uh, concerning financial institutions and money laundering. Uh, banks are perfectly uh, legitimate and important institutions. We have imposed on them an obligation not simply to take cash and close their eyes as to who brings it to them and what the source of that money was, but to ask questions about their customers and to ask questions about the source of cash that may be deposited with them. The question is a delicate question, and I would cite to you the most recent example where I think there was a successful negotiation between brand owners and, uh, and intermediaries in the case of YouTube-like sites, where a number of user-generated content sites uh, signed a, a voluntary agreement of principles with content owners adopting and uh, committing to adopt by the end of this year filtering technology, which they recognized was commercially available and techno technologically feasible. And I think the question becomes, uh, for uh, other institutions, other sectors, such as the ones you reference, financial intermediaries. I think you could ask the same question about shippers, warehousers, uh, retailers. The question becomes, can, uh, what is it reasonable for those sectors, to, what actions are reasonable for those sectors to take, and how can they work collectively with brand owners that from the point of view of protecting the health and safety in many cases of consumers and preventing pirates and counterfeiters from using their infrastructure, what actions can they take? Would it, would it be feasible um, to have a government agency uh, tasked with developing, you know, it would be the sort of the IP terrorist watch list that <laughs> at least companies would be on notice, uh, even if there wasn't a legal prohibition against their doing business, they couldn't very well claim ignorance uh, if they're processing credit card transactions or advertising on uh, clearly um, uh, pirate or piracy-oriented sites. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Cotton just pointed out what the, what the problem is in, in doing something like that, is that you're just opening up the floodgates to massive litigation against every single company that might have any kind of tangential relationship to copyright infringement. I mean, this is a court in California in a case involving a, uh, a pornography site had sued MasterCard and Visa claiming that, you know, ev that because it had given financial services to other websites that had stolen their, you know, pornographic uh, uh, pictures, that it was not, they were not liable. I just think that, you know, if, if you open the floodgates in that way, then, then you're just, you're going to be flooding the courts with people going, copyright trolls, basically, you refer to patent trolls, copyright trolls going after every single company which might have the most tangential relationship to an infringing website and so. Well, uh, I mean, you might be if you if you um, enacted some liability for doing business with someone on the list, um, but if you if you post the list of um, piracy sites, I mean, how does that expand the liability other than putting people on notice? In other words. If, if the top 10 uh, websites are responsible for 60% uh, of all the piracy, and I'm just guessing at a big number, and you can identify those and you can stigmatize doing business with those, why does that open floodgates of litigation? Uh, and if it would deter 
legitimate companies from doing business with those websites, wouldn't that be desirable? I think that might be a good marketplace solution to the problem. I'm not sure <laughs> government should be involved, but it might be a nice, yeah, do a, you know, sort of do a watch list or a hall of shame. The time of the... Problem with that. the, the if, if I might just make one point of, uh, in, uh, just in, to be clear what I said, which was I was referring to negotiated agreements between sectors, and that is what the CACP is endeavoring to accomplish before we turn to the question of, of legal, uh, legal standards or legal questions. The time of the gentleman is expired. I, I have one short question for C. Galmandelker. The you testified that the department implemented all 31 recommendations from the IP task force report. One of the recommendations was that the FBI should increase the number of agents dedicated to IP investigations. Can you tell me how many FBI agents are dedicated to IP investigations, meaning that's their full-time job? I, I can't give you a specific uh, number since I'm from the uh, criminal division, but I'm happy to uh, make that inquiry and, re and, and report back to the Good. committee. I, I can tell you that they've in increased the number of arrests um, and indictments, and I'm also happy to provide those okay. those statistics. I just, uh, uh, that's, that's important and that's good and that's useful, but I'd like just the name and phone number of one FBI agent who has been said full time, this is your job. Uh, if you could find that out, that would be great for me. And uh, there are a lot of, a lot of comments I can make, but I think we have a vote coming up. Uh, this has been a very, I think, very useful panel, very interesting, a lot of issues raised, uh, not all of them resolved. Uh, and I appreciate all of you uh, uh, coming. And uh, with that, uh, unless anybody says something different, I'm gonna adjourn the hearing.